Hello and welcome to BioE 1010 Module 2. Today we're going to talk about proteins, specifically their structure and functions. But before we get started, we're going to talk a little bit about a review of basic chemistry that's going to be very important for our discussion of proteins. First off, matter is made of a combination of elements. It's important to know a couple of basic definitions here. Elements are substances that cannot be converted into other substances, and an atom is the smallest particle of that element that still retains its distinctive chemical properties. There are a couple of definitions here regarding chemical particles that I would like you all to know. We're going to be using these terms extensively throughout the class. Again, an atom is the smallest particle of an element that has the properties of that element. Electrons are very important to our uh, discussion of chemical bonding. And here are the electrons. Uh, these are extremely small particles with almost no weight. They carry a negative charge, and they're in constant motion around the nucleus. These are also responsible for a lot of the chemical bonding we're going to be talking about. If a particle has an electrical charge to it because it has either gained or lost one or more electrons, we call that particle an ion. And finally, a molecule is a particle formed by the chemical union of two or more atoms. Here we have a discussion of filled and unfilled electron shells. Electron shells are just a model of how um, our elements work. Uh, this is a good way to understand chemical bonding and it is the model we're going to be talking about. Um, here we have lower electron shells, for instance, in this hydrogen here, uh, we have one electron shell and they're filled first. So this first electron shell is closer to the nucleus of hydrogen here. Um, and each cell can hold a limited number of electrons. The first cell of hydrogen can hold two electrons. You see it only has one here. So if the outermost shell is complete, the atom is stable. If the outermost shell is not complete, the atom is unstable or reactive. So hydrogen is reactive because it has one electron, but it really wants two in this shell. If you look over here at helium and neon, you can see that helium has two electrons in its outer shell. So this is a complete electron shell, making helium a noble gas and a pretty unreactive, non-reactive element. Again, you can see neon here has eight electrons in its outer shell. This electron uh, shell here in neon wants to have eight, so again it's full. If you look next to it, here we have fluorine. Fluorine is a very reactive and a very electronegative element. We're going to get to electronegativity in a minute. You can see it has seven electrons in its outer shell, so if it gets one more electron, we're going to be able to have a a full outer shell. So fluorine is really going to want another electron to fill its outer shell here. The outermost shell of electrons determines how atoms interact. Here you can see sodium and chlorine next to each other. Again, if these two come together, we have table salt. Chlorine needs only one more electron in its outer shell, and sodium needs one less electron in its outer shell. So if these get together, sodium is going to donate its outermost electron to chlorine, then they're both going to be um, happy about that because they're both going to have a full electron uh, shell. So to achieve a complete outermost shell, which again is the goal of a lot of these elements, unstable atoms gain, lose, or share. Gain, lose, or share valence electrons. Again, valence electrons are electrons in our outermost shell. So this gain, losing, or sharing of electrons is what uh, we call a chemical reaction and a chemical bond. Again, molecules are held together by chemical bonds. We're going to talk about covalent and ionic bonds here. Here's an example of a molecule. This is butane. This is a straight chain hydrocarbon. Again, it is a molecule because it's more than one element, two or more elements held together by uh, chemical bonds. So let's talk about ionic bonds first. This is the electrostatic attraction between a cation and an anion. Uh, so in the form, formation of an ionic compound, metals lose electrons and nonmetals gain electrons. Remember we talked about sodium has only one 
valence electron that's one electron in its outer shell. So it's going to donate that electron to chlorine, which has seven valence electrons, and it wants eight. So after this happens, sodium has a stable outer shell because it's full, and so does chlorine because it has this one electron that was donated to it from sodium. So the donation of electron leads to the formation of an ionic bond. Now sodium is positively charged because it has lost an electron, and chlorine is negatively charged because it has gained an electron. And remember, electrons are negatively charged. The second major type of bond is a covalent bond. This is when two or more atoms bond with each other, and this bond um, is a sharing of electrons. So here we have two oxygen molecules. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. Six electrons in its outermost shell. So if you get two oxygens together, they both need to have two more electrons in their outer shell to make eight. So what they do is they share electrons. So here you can see they're both sharing two electrons from each other, giving each oxygen molecule eight valence electrons. So this is a double bond. If we look at water, water is, of course, H2O. Here we have two hydrogens. Remember, hydrogen has one valence electron. Oxygen has six. So they're going to want to share. Each hydrogen is going to share an electron with each oxygen, giving hydrogen two valence electrons and oxygen eight valence electrons. So again, this is a single bond where one pair of electrons is being shared between two molecules. The next important topic is polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. So these, we're talking about only covalent bonds here, not ionic bonds. Uh, so a nonpolar covalent bond is when atoms have the same affinity for the shared electrons. This is the case with the hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen has the same affinity for electrons as hydrogen because they are the same molecule. So they are going to equally share these two electrons that form this covalent bond. This is called a nonpolar covalent bond. However, if we look at oxygen, we have uh, molecules with different affinities for the shared electrons. So oxygen is more electronegative, and electronegativity is the tendency or the desire for, an elect uh, for a molecule to acquire electrons. So oxygen wants those electrons more than hydrogen does. It is more electronegative. So if we're sharing these two electrons that represent this chemical bond, Oxygen sh wants them more, so they're closer to oxygen than they are to hydrogen, which gives us a polarity to our bond. The electron density of this molecule is greater around oxygen, giving it a polarity, or a slight negative charge near the oxygen, and a slight positive charge near the hydrogen. This is what we call a polar covalent bond. Again, polar covalent bonds are when there are two molecules sharing electrons, and those molecules have different electronegativities. Electronegativity, again, is a chemical property that describes the tendency of an atom or a functional group, which is a collection of atoms, to attract electrons or electron density toward itself. And if you go to the right and up on the periodic table, this is a general trend towards an increase in electronegativity, except of course for our noble gases that have full electron shells. So if we look here at fluorine, fluorine is the most electronegative element. It wants electrons more than any other element. Again, you see oxygen right next to it. It's also pretty electronegative. There is, of course, a difference between a polarity in bonds and a polarity in molecules. So if we're talking about whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar, that depends both on bond type and molecular shape. So if we look at both water and carbon dioxide, they both have polar covalent bonds. 
So we have oxygen next to carbon in carbon dioxide. Again, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it's going to take the electron cloud a little bit more and have a partial uh, negative charge, leaving carbon with a partial positive charge. So that's a polar covalent bond. However, carbon dioxide is not a polar molecule. It is nonpolar, and that is because of the shape of the molecule. There's an oxygen, a carbon, and an oxygen in a straight line. So you have oxygen and oxygen, of course, with the same electronegativity, both equally pulling on those electrons that carbon is sharing, such that there is no polarity in this molecule. However, if we look at water, that also has a polar covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Again, oxygen is more electronegative, so has a partial negative charge. Here we have two hydrogens um, forming off oxygen, but they're in a bent shape. Okay, there's sort of a V-shape here, which gives a partial negative charge to the oxygen part of the molecule and a partial positive charge to both hydrogen regions in the molecule, making uh, water a molecule that has both polar covalent bonds and is a polar molecule, as opposed to carbon dioxide, which has polar covalent bonds, but is a nonpolar molecule. And of course, this is contrasted to methane, which has nonpolar covalent bonds. So these carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. And this, of course, with nonpolar covalent bonds throughout the molecule, gives us a nonpolar molecule. Uh, remember when we were talking about electronegativity, we said it was the tendency of an atom or a functional group to attract electrons to itself. Here are some very common functional groups found in our biological molecules. I'm going to be referring to these type of functional groups throughout this course, so it's very important that you know which functional group I'm talking about when I say the word hydroxyl group or methyl group. Um, in this uh, diagram R represents the rest of the molecule that we're not necessarily interested in. So R is some sort of chemical composition here. And our functional group is everything that is not the R. So in this case, the hydroxyl group is some molecule, whatever it may be, with an oxygen and a hydrogen appended on the end. And of course, this is a polar functional group. Methyl groups are, are, again, some molecule with a CH3 functional group on the end. And of course, this is nonpolar because those carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. A carbonyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen in the middle of a molecule. So we have R and R prime. That means there's some sort of molecule over here and more over here. And in the middle, we have this carbon-oxygen double bond. A carboxyl group is an R group with a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and also an OH group here. This is charged and acts as an acid. An amino group, which of course we're going to be talking a lot about today because we're talking about amino acids, is an R, which can be again anything, with a nitrogen and two hydrogens on the end. Again, this is charged accepts a hydrogen to form NH3. And since amino groups can remove hydrogen from solution, they are considered basic. So this carboxyl group is acidic. This amino group is basic. Uh, if this carboxyl group were going to be charged, it would be negative, and this amino uh, group is often positive. Another common group is a phosphate group. This is R with a phosphorus molecule connected to four oxygens. One of the oxygens is a single bond, one is a double bond, two of the oxygens have hydrogens. This is again charged and it can be considered acidic in solution. And finally a sulfhydryl group is R with sulfur and a hydrogen on the end and this is polar because of the electronegativity of sulfur. Hydrogen bonds are going to be very important to our discussion of biological molecules. And a hydrogen bond is an attraction between an electronegative atom that is connected to a hydrogen and, on a different molecule, another electronegative element. So the requirements for a hydrogen bond are 
hydrogen on one molecule that is connected to an electronegative element. Here we have oxygen, more electronegative than hydrogen. And on a separate molecule, an electronegative element, in this case, is oxygen. So this is the hydrogen bond. You see we have a partial negative charge set up on this water molecule, and on a different molecule we have a positive, a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. This is the hydrogen bond. It's a weak bond, but it is still very important in our discussion of biological molecules. And the final chemistry concept that we're going to go over before we get into amino acids is hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. Hydrophilic molecules are water-loving and hydrophobic molecules are water-fearing. So a hydrophilic molecule is either charged or able to form hydrogen bonds and they dissolve readily in water. An example of this is ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol with two carbon molecules. So our functional group here is a hydroxyl group. So in our diagram, this would be our R, and this would be our functional group. Again, remember, the OH group is polar, um, giving us the ability to form hydrogen bonds because of our partial negative and partial positive charge here. This molecule is going to dissolve in water, and it, it is able to form hydrogen bonds. So this is a hydrophilic or water-loving molecule. As opposed to hydrophobic or water-fearing molecules, these have no polar bonds. So they do not dissolve in water and they're not able to form hydrogen bonds. An example of this is butane. Butane is a straight four carbon molecule and all of the bonds are simply carbon hydrogen bonds, which are non-polar covalent bonds. So this molecule has no regions of positive or negative charge, so it has no polarity. Therefore, it is a hydrophobic or water-fearing molecule.